Metamorphosis, a profound change in form, substance, appearance, character, or circumstances. If transformation is what you seek, be open to the possibilities. Your transformation is up to you. Hi, I'm Bonnie Gerwitz, a business and life coach. Welcome to Metamorphosis. Our show is about change and how our guests have reinvented themselves, sometimes more than once. As a coach, I've witnessed many changes in people's lives. Some were small and some were major, but the changes were always significant. So today I'm really, really pleased to have as my guest, Ruth Applehoff, Hi, Bonnie. Hi, Ruth. <laughs> Ruth is the executive director of Guild Hall of East Hampton. We're so happy to have you here today. Thank you. It's wonderful to be here. It's great. We have so much to cover. I'm going to jump right in. You've been called a turnaround specialist and a force of nature. So what do you think that means? <laughs> <laughs> well, I hope it's good. I, I think it is. But uh, actually, I I think it's very flattering, um, and I think it refers to the positions that I've had in various museums around the country, and how, in fact, when I entered the position as the director of the museum in Virginia, or the one in Minnesota, or the one in Connecticut, that I saw that there were ways that we could improve our programming. It's kind of common sense, but to tell you the truth, it works if you, if you can find that little niche that you mm -hmm. can develop and, and bring on board when you're there. Uh, it does turn around the institution, and I think a lot of it is luck, too. And, of course, most of it is just all the great people that you have around you that are going to help you sure, out. Sure, yeah. sure. But I guess when you go into a new institution like that, bringing your own vision, mm -hmm. you see it's probably an instinctive thing for you that you may not realize it is instinctive, <laughs> but that when you go in, you see mm -hmm. where the changes can be and how you can make it a better, a better That's museum. That's right. In fact, someone told me that it's always good to make some kind of dynamic change in the first 90 days that oh, you're really? on a job. So I always try to do that and think about, well, what can this be? And when I was in Birmingham, Alabama, I discovered that uh, they had a very small and uh, not very interesting um, collection of contemporary art. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a huge museum, and it is encyclopedic, but they never really took any time to look at the contemporary art aspect of it. So uh, right away, I thought, huh, you know, I love this. I could do this. Mm -hmm. And um, it developed not only into a wonderful art collection, in the contemporary area, but also a photography uh, collection that now is world renowned. Oh, wow. Yeah. So that must feel it was real fun. good. Yeah, yeah, it was great. <laughs> Absolutely. I have a couple of quotes here, not to embarrass you too much. Uh, Alec Baldwin, who is on your board of trustees, mm -hmm. said, Ruth has taken this beloved yet once quaint institution <laughs> and turned it into the creative hub of our area. Nice. And Robert Stern, the architect, who worked on Guildhall's massive restoration project, said that you rekindled a sleepy regional art center on Long Island, transforming it into a vibrant destination for the performing and visual arts that meets the expectations of first-rank artists and audiences whose benchmarks are the theaters, art galleries, and mu museums of New York City. That's very nice. quite a big statement. <laughs> yeah. Quite a big statement. That's lovely. It really is. And of course, um, both of these gentlemen are, are you know, wonderful to me and to Guildhall and are very important to Guildhall's future, which mm -hmm. is now, I'm calling it a renaissance, but it truly is. Since our uh, renovation, which we went through oh, over a five-year period, mm -hmm. um, when things were very difficult because we were staying open. We wanted to have exhibitions. We wanted to have theater right. programs. But still, we knew that we had to bring that place up to the 21st century. And yeah. uh, it was 
exciting, wonderful working with Bob Stern. Oh, what a major master, master of architecture and all of the various people that he brought into the project, including Ben Kirk Kerpensky, who really donated his time wow. to uh, help uh, rebuild Guildhall into the great facility it is now. And you did major work in, in the John Drew Theater. Yeah. Uh, the, I mean, it's beautiful. It is beautiful, but it shouldn't look too different. I hope it doesn't because we've struggled. We worked so hard to make sure that we kept that jewel box mm -hmm. look to the theater that we all love uh, and not make it too fancy. You know, some people were suggesting, oh, you should have velvet seats with gold wood framing around them. And I said, no, you know, let's keep that sure. kind of beachy look to it and right. make sure that we're, uh, we have that same feeling so that people feel welcome. They're, they don't feel put off, we're but absolutely. they feel like this is their home and they can come anytime. Right. But it, it's been incredible. Uh, we've been finished with the renovation for now three years. And in those three years, We've had better and better programming, more and more people coming. And this is true in the museum where we can actually have works of art. We borrowed last summer from um, the Whitney Museum and the Museum of Modern Art. Uh, you know, that's a wonderful opportunity for us that we didn't have prior to the renovation. And of course, in the theater, with all the light and sound, the surround sound and the wonderful equipment that we have in there, um, we're now able to show these uh, Metropolitan Opera live broadcasts. Oh, I know. That's so great. They're so great. Oh, my gosh. So it, it's, it's been a, a wonderful gift. I hope the, the community feels this way. I know they do. What, why do you think that now suddenly, or maybe because you raised the bar, that you're able to get these exhibits? exhibitions from New York City more easily now than you were before? Well, uh, much of it has to do with the facility itself. Mm -hmm. You have to have the exact right temperature, the exact oh, right humidity. You have to have very good security, mm -hmm. no light spilling in. Um, all of the uh, accoutrements of the building itself right. really add up to this. Um, it's the, uh, actually designed by the American Association of Museums, and they say what the parameters are. And if you fall within those parameters, then you can borrow work from any museum oh, in the world. So what, what a coup. Yeah, it's very important. That's fabulous. Mm -hmm. yeah, it really does give the community a great opportunity. It does. It does. And as a result, we've had exhibitions like Barbara Kruger, who came in and did a big installation for us. Uh, Barbara is a major, major artist. and someone that we had hoped to get, oh, for years. We've been asking her to do something, and she finally came once we had the renovation completed. And Eric Fischel and Richard Prince did a great show for us two years ago. I mean, these are all major artists that are sought after worldwide, and we have the opportunity to show them here. Wow, that's great. Yeah. I know that you give a lot of credit to your staff. I do. And to your trustees, who do a lot of work. Yeah. But from what I've read and just from what I've seen, it seems that you're the visionary. It has to start oh. somewhere with yeah, that's, someone. That's very and nice. Then <laughs> you pick, and then you, you know, had to pick a staff, yeah, of yeah, course. Of course. And so, um, but I, it has to start somewhere. So it seems to me like it started with you and your yeah. vision and what you brought with you from all of your experience at all of those other museums. Well, thank you. I'm sure that happens. But the way I see it from my perspective is that I sit at a round table in meetings with the staff or the board, and everybody gives their opinion. And there are no holes barred, <laughs> believe me. And so they're all sitting around saying yes, no, maybe. And what I try to do is put myself in their shoes as they're talking mm -hmm. and try to see what it is that they're really interested and passionate about. And if I can give them the opportunity to follow that passion, it just makes all the difference in the world. Oh, sure. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, and it's for people that, for I would imagine, just from circumstances and jobs that I've had, there's a wonderful thing 
feeling you get when people listen to you. Yeah. It's you know, important. they not always are they going to take what you suggested. It may not mm -hmm. work within the framework of the entire facility, but it's really nice to know that you've been yeah. heard. I think so, and of course, I appreciate it when I'm heard as well. But honestly, my my leadership technique is to listen as much as I possibly can before saying anything. I, I just really appreciate all of the opinions and all of our staff there, each one an expert in their field. Mm -hmm. You know, they each one have wonderful experience and knowledge and know-how and, oh, they're, they're really a terrific team. That's great, mm -hmm. that's great. I know too, um, the, the, the year-round residents out in East Hampton have really changed. It's a lot more diverse than mm -hmm. it used to be in a lot of ways, ethnically, um, economically, racially, and that you care a great deal about this community, mm -hmm. which was part of your vision, is to make the museum a place where everyone could come right. and learn you know, and get an education mm -hmm. um, so that the museum is not standoffish right. and that people wouldn't feel comfortable coming here, mm -hmm. which it's is great. It's extremely important, and it's hard to figure that out because if you're having Steve Martin come to Guildhall and he's expensive to get there, yes. uh, you have to talk to a lot of people about how they need to help you bring that talent you know, they are underwriters, they're angels in the theater. And then you have to figure out, okay, how can I get the mailman here as well right. as some of the, you know, the, the more well-heeled uh, people in the sure. community. So we try to tier all of our seat prices. So if you wanted to come but you couldn't pay the higher price to sit up in front, you can sit in the balcony and believe me, at Guildhall, there are only 360 seats. So every seat is a good seat. Mm -hmm. It's really a, a, an incredible place to see a performance. And by doing that in that little theater, you feel like you're part of it. It's much more mm -hmm. of an intimate experience than it is if you were in New York City. Oh, with, with his 1,000 yeah, seats. Yeah. And then we try to figure out other ways with the Hamptons Institute, which has been fashioned after the Aspen Institute. It's kind of a think tank weekend. Um, we give people an opportunity to meet all of these wonderful uh, thought uh, leaders. And you know they can go to the dinners or the cocktail parties mm -hmm. or have a lunch with them. But there are always ways that we can make it a little bit more of an experience for someone, and that's our goal. That's wonderful. Mm -hmm. It just makes it such a, uh, makes it a personal experience. Yeah, that's right. Rather than just, oh, I went to see mm -hmm. and wasn't involved at all. Yeah. But that's really, really special. I think that's very special. You originally came to East Hampton a long time ago. Mm -hmm. You were working on a, was it a master's thesis? Yes, it was. You were yeah. working on a master's thesis, and you decided to interview Lee Krasner. Mm -hmm. Now, now, I'd like to know, how did you talk her into letting you come yeah. and pr really live with her I and know. interview her? Um, I was like, <laughs> how'd you do that? Well, I must admit, I thought it was quite amazing myself. <laughs> but um, as it turns out, uh, I was at Syracuse University working on my master's thesis, raising two kids, actually, when I was going through school, I would take one course a semester mm -hmm. because I was a war orphan. And a war orphan got a little stipend for each semester that you could use to pay your tuition. So I spent many, many years in college because I could only take one course at a time. But nevertheless, I finally ended up with a PhD some years later. But when I was doing the master's thesis, I had a wonderful professor. Her name was Anja Lemke at, up at, at Syracuse in library science. And she said to each of us, choose someone that you want to do a bibliography about. Mm -hmm. And I'm very passionate about women artists and women in the theater and women's rights. And mm -hmm. so I thought, well, I'm going to choose a woman that I really love. I love their work, you know, very exciting work. And so I thought, well, Lee Krasner, she'd be perfect. Now, what I found in all of this 
research that I've been doing, and I've done this with many artists, is that women artists never really have enough attention. They really don't, and it's not because they need more attention, it's because they don't really have the focus of the press and the galleries and the museums on them. It's mainly, you know, the male artists. Sure. So I sent her a, a little note with my, you know, little bibliography I had sent, which she was blown away. No one had ever done that for her. Oh, wow. No one had ever shown her how many times she had been mentioned in an article or in a book. So I was able to uh, get in the door uh, with that document. She asked me to come down to New York and meet her, and we had a wonderful talk. And I ended up helping uh, at the Corcoran uh, Gallery with an exhibition that she did down mm -hmm. there. So we became fast friends, and she said, well, come out to the Hamptons with me, and you can spend the summer there, and we'll work together. So, wow, you know, I, I was thrilled. I picked her up in New York. We drove out here. Um, but it was soon after that I discovered that she didn't drive. And in fact, oh. the only way she could get around is to invite someone to come out every summer and stay with her. So I ended up being the chauffeur. <laughs> which was fine, you know. I loved it. I got to go see, you know, lots of other artists. Oh, and, which is so oh, amazing. Oh, it was fantastic. But uh, so that's how I got in. Wow. Well, yeah. That's great. That's great. So when I go, well, if I go all the way back, you, you were interested in art as a child. <laughs> I mean, it started a long time ago. Yeah. What was this something that drew you to it, or? Oh. What I can remember is a next door neighbor who had a huge, gorgeous studio in her home. She did um, ads, drawings for Woodruff, Woodruff and Lothrop, which oh, was a big right. store well, in Washington, D.C. I know it. And um, those drawings of, you know, women's costumes, mm -hmm. just, uh, they were thrilling to me. I mean, her whole her studio was so gorgeous and that I could see what she drew in the studio would be in the newspaper the next right. week. So it, that kind of triggered it for me. But the <clears throat> probably the basis for the story is that when I was growing up, we would go, we would play hooky in Washington. I was outside in Maryland. And my girlfriends and I would take a day off of school. We'd go downtown to see a movie or something, and then we would go someplace else. And I loved going to the National Gallery. Mm -hmm. The National Gallery for me was, it was a palace, right. you know, and I'd walk in there thinking, I can come to this. I'm, you know, it was just, it was a thrill. So I can just remember walking through those halls and seeing all that glorious art and being totally, you know, transformed by it. Amazing. But you, it seems to me, and you may disagree, that in reading a lot of information about you, you really seem to stay very focused on the art world. Whereas, you know, other people would say, oh, do a little art, dabble, do, <laughs> you know, I had a choice when I was a kid. It was mm -hmm. art or music, because yeah. I loved them both. My parents pretty much said, pick one, you know, because we can't do all this. So, yeah. you know, and it, but it's interesting to me that you just seem to have stayed on track. You may not feel that way. Well, yeah. It, it, um, the way I see it is that uh, practically every five years I made a shift. Now, yes, I did stay in the art world, but uh, I started out, I actually had my own gallery, and I was a painter, very serious, and then um, I taught, taught for the State University of New York and then at Syracuse University. Mm -hmm. I then was the curator of Syracuse uh, Museum there, which was lovely. Then I got a, a, a fellowship to the Whitney, and oh. it was a year's fellowship that wow. uh, they uh, invited me down, and I could pretty much do whatever I wanted. It was amazing. So I started working in, then in the curatorial department, doing research, and loved that, and thought, oh my goodness, I really don't want to be a painter. I really want to <clears throat> get into the museum business uh, you know, from a curatorial mm -hmm. point of view, which I think is an artistic endeavor on its own anyway. Yeah. But anyway, I, uh, I had the good fortune then of going from 
the Whitney to several other museums as a curator and then as the director of these museums. But each one was very different. I mean, there, mm -hmm. it, it, it feels to me like I was able to take advantage of the best opportunity at each of my kind of mile posts. But right. um, it certainly doesn't feel like a straight line at no, all. No, no, and, and from <clears throat> what you're saying is there was there were changes mm -hmm. every place you went because yeah. they were everything. Well, first of all, every institution works differently, mm -hmm. but the jobs were also a little different, and yeah. you were able to create some of what you wanted to do. They seemed to let you do that, which is great. <laughs> you know, that's not so. <laughs> uh, that's a little unusual. Yeah, yeah, that you could just go and say, oh, "I'm going to do this," and people right. go, "Okay." Well. There was a little talk in between, <laughs> but yeah. <laughs> no, but I, that's amazing to me. Now, you have a new program this year, the Artists and Writers Program. Yes, we Tell do. Tell me about that. Coming up June and July, we're having uh, celebrating the Artists and Writers baseball game. Now, this baseball game has been going on for 35 years, wow. and a, a lot of great artists and writers were in that baseball game game and still are. The game is in August, but we're doing the show at Guildhall in June and July. And um, we have the most amazing committee of people that are working on this and organizing it with our curator, Christina Strassfield. And uh, we've, we've looked at the list of all, I mean, over a hundred people who wow. have been in these games. And many of the artists have work in our collection. Now, Guildhall has a major art collection of the artists from the East End, but we very rarely get to show it. So this is a great opportunity for us to, you know, take these beautiful works out of storage and exhibit them in this exhibition, the Artists and Writers exhibition, mm -hmm. along with a lot of programs we're going to be doing on stage. Some of the writers will be talking. Uh, Ed Blyer, a former board member, will be doing a panel with artists and writers on each side. It's going to be very lively, and I think it'll really appeal to the community. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, it's going to be great. They're it going to love exciting. it. It sounds exciting. It is. Very exciting. <laughs> I think we're even going to include a little memorabilia, some baseball bats or something, hats mm -hmm. or whatever. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but, you have, but you have such a huge, a huge amount of stuff to choose from. Yes. And so many people, like you mm -hmm. said. I mean, Willem de Kooning was in the games. Alec Baldwin is oh, he, in the I games. Did, well, that yeah. I knew, but I didn't know William de Kooning was yeah. in the games. Yeah, we actually have a photograph of him. Oh, that's at great. Bat. Yeah. That's great. So the art is going to be very, very fine, as are the, the writers and their programs. We're going to actually display uh, all of the books. I think we're going to ask for one, one book from each of the writers. Many of them have written many books, but I'm sure. it'll be very nice, I think, for the community to come in and see all of this and to understand the importance of something that we consider a very exciting part of our history here. That's so funny because I think a lot of people just probably think, oh yeah, they're it's doing the game. ball game <laughs> again this yeah, year. Right. You know, because you, you read about it yeah. in all the local publications That's and right. probably even farther, probably towards the city in mm -hmm. publications. And so this mm -hmm. is going to make it much more special. Oh, it's going to be great. And yeah. the fact that the community can really get involved and see mm -hmm. it, it will make it even back more exciting. Yeah. Back to the experience. Yeah. And how did yeah. it all happen? Yeah. Yeah. Who participated? Yeah. You know, they'll be, I think they'll probably be surprised at who some of the people that participated. Almost every artist out here, uh, men and women. Yeah. That's great. It's really great. That yeah. is great. So I'm curious, I have this question. Um, what advice would your 100-year-old self give you about this moment in your life? Well, first of all, I hope I get to that 100-year-old <laughs> self. And um, I think that advice would be to, uh, to really just, I don't know, just be so happy with what I'm doing. I'm full of joy, and, and, and it's just a genuine thrill to be at Guild Hall with all these great artists and people that I know and love and a wonderful staff and a great board. And 
I guess my advice would be to just smell the roses because it doesn't get much better. That's so nice to be so happy in what you're doing. Yeah, it's great. It's a, I think it's a wonderful message to those people who are watching our show. If you can find the passion, the things that you love to do, if you give yourself permission to do mm -hmm. them, sometimes we fight. We keep thinking, oh, if I do that, then how will I do this? And I have responsibilities and all of that. Mm -hmm. But that to see someone like you who is so passionate about what she does and so happy and so grateful, it's from yeah. what I hear, to have had this opportunity and for, to be doing it as long as you have and yeah. that there's still this whole future ahead of you <laughs> to participate and to do this wonderful thing. It's really great that everybody should follow their passions in life. Absolutely. The life is short. <laughs> the older you get, the faster it goes. <laughs> You notice that. It's like, what, a year just went by. So I think that's just amazing. Yeah. Amazing. And you're a good example, I think. You know, you kept going. You kept moving. You kept, yeah. you had opportunities. You could have turned them down. You saw in, I think you saw in each place you went an opportunity mm -hmm. to grow yourself. Yes. To learn, to learn more. That's really and true. And to make a difference in where you mm -hmm. went. Mm -hmm. You know, as you noticed probably that you made a difference, then, <laughs> you know, the first time is always the hardest. Then you saw, you know, I made a difference there. Mm -hmm. Their program is, it really raised the bar. They're doing more contemporary mm -hmm. art. Mm -hmm. I can take this on the road. Yeah. And yeah. I can do this at other places. Yeah. So I think Guildhall here is very fortunate. Well, I'm very fortunate to be there. Thank you, Bonnie. I have really enjoyed this. Oh, thank you so much for being here. And everyone should take advantage of the programs and the exhibitions at Guildhall, because it's really all quite, quite wonderful. Thank you so much for being no, here. No, my pleasure. And please, everyone, tune in again. <laughs>